shit, you got big face right off the beginning. What's up, new guy? I'm the Degenerate 75. I'm a DFS content creator who knows a lot about PGA DFS, and I'm here to help you get a little bit better. If you don't know, this week be the Ryder Cup. And there's a lot of content to break down because a lot of you don't know this format, and this is what this is going to be. You're going to want to hang around till the end because I have my buddy Tom Jacobs on to tell us everything we need to know about the Ryder Cup. But these first few minutes, I want to just walk you through a little bit about what the Ryder Cup is, how this format is going to be played at DFS, and help you get going. So now, let's switch over to this screen. First of all, don't forget Thursday night. Not Wednesday night, Thursday night at 7.30. Editor put the wrong fucking time in there. 7.30, we will be doing the live stream. I want to let the Thursday night football game lock, and then we will do the stream. So be looking out for that because lock is like, what, 12.30 a.m. Friday night. So we're only going to have five hours from the time my stream starts until lock. You'll want to be there to get everything you know from ownership to theory to uh, getting your Q&A done, okay? So make sure you're there, 7.30. Not 7, fucking editor, 7.30, all right? Okay, let's get to this. First of all, this is called the Ryder Cup, all right? You got 12 Americans, you got 12 Europeans, you see them, right? And they are going to play in a set of matches over three days. It will consist of eight matches on Friday, eight matches on Saturday, and 12 singles matches on Sunday, okay? The goal is there's 28 possible team points to get, and the goal is, of course, to get 14 and a half of them. That's, a, that, that's more than half of uh, 28, okay? So that is what they'll be playing for. Now, within this, you got to look at the schedule, new guy, because if you're new to this stuff, you're not going to understand what the hell's going on here. You'll see Friday morning, the there'll be foursome matches. This is something you're going to need to know, the difference between foursomes and four balls. Foursomes are where it's going to be two Americans versus two Europeans playing head-to-head -head match, right? But they will alternate shots. The one American will hit and then the next American will hit and then one American will hit and you'll just play at match play but they are partners playing in a match play right whereas in the afternoon both days both Friday and Saturday the afternoons are what's going to be called four balls that's where everybody just plays their own individual ball right Victor Hovland plays his ball all the way through he makes a bogey and then you know he's partnered up with John Rom and John Rom plays all the way through and he makes a birdie the team score is a birdie for that hole you take the best score of the two guys okay even though they're playing independently of each other it's like they're playing a solo scramble almost right and they just get to take their best score and that is what will consist of there'll be four foursome matches um friday morning there'll be four four ball matches friday afternoon and then the same thing will repeat saturday so right there we'll have four matches four matches and then saturday we'll also have four matches you see them right here another four matches and another four matches and then sunday we'll have 12 so there'll be four uh, chances to get points here points so you can get four points here four points here that's eight another four here that's 12 another four here is 16 and then there'll be 12 singles matches for a grand total of 28 points Every single player will play Sunday, but that is the only match they are guaranteed. From there, the captains uh, for the first four sessions, so Friday morning, Friday afternoon, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, the captains will get to pick who plays and who they play with. Okay, So this is a pretty big power. Zach Johnson, as you can see, is the captain for America, right? And the captain for Europe is Luke Donald. Who? Uh, anyways, so... This The only pairings that we are going to know is going to be those Friday foursomes. That's the only ones we'll know because they won't announce the Friday afternoon ones until the morning round has completed, right? So we got to take this little snippet of information we're going to have, just who is going to be the guys playing Friday morning, and then we have to make some really big extrapolations about who is most likely to play, who is most likely to win, and who is most likely to get us the most DK points, DraftKings points, so that we can win GPPs, okay? That's it. That's it. That's the basic format of it. Now you're saying, well, how the hell do they keep score? Well, just like they normally do, right? If you win a hole, you get points. If you played the Dell match play this year or you played the uh, President's Cup last year, all the same scoring still applies. You get points for streaks. You get points for winning holes. You get points for winning the match. You get points for winning the match before with holes left over. You get bonus points for all of that. So there's a lot of way to accumulate points. But basically, you want your guy going out there and kicking the other guy's ass or your guys to go out there and be kicking the other guy's asses, okay? As far as contest goes this week, the good news is there are some big contests. Okay, 600,000. Uh, you can see there's a 200,000, 100,000. So there's some big prize pools out there. The bad news is, is they're all super top heavy, right? You know how I feel about contest selection, but let's just be thankful that they have them. But I think what's really going to confuse people and maybe uh, drive the interest of this down is it's a different format, right? This is the, one of the few times in golf we ever see the captain mode. And all you need to know about captain mode is your captain gets 1.5x points of the other players, right? 
right? You're like, oh, shit. So you're telling me if I play Victor Hovland and he goes 5-0, and oh, I get extra points? Yes, you do, if you have him as, as his captain. But notice, even though the captain gets 1.5x points, which it shows you right here, they're also 1.5x more expensive, right? When you go over here, Victor Hovland's only 8,800. But when you want to go put him in at captain, damn, now he's 13,200, right? That's a big difference, right? So, yeah, you can have Victor Hovland as your captain, but just know that he is quite a bit more expensive, and that is going to have a big impact impact on the rest of your lineup because now you're like well then i want to get rory and rome and can't lay and, and and xander well you can't do that because you just ran out of money bob see what i'm saying so you're gonna have to be strategic about how you build your lineups you're going to have to find some strategic punts down here. You can see the cheapest guy is 4000 So, you know, it's going to be very hard. Even if you go, yeah, yeah, oh, God, Shane Lowry and, okay, that's a gross lineup. But that's how you would build it, right? At least that one stays within the constraints of a salary cap, right? So the key is you're going to want to have guys that are out there uh, the most, right? And then not only do you want your guys out there playing the most matches, you need your guys out there playing the most matches and winning, right? So there's going to be a lot of strategy involved with this, building optimal lineups, giving yourself the best chance, and playing the correlation game because this is one of the few times all year we ever get true correlation at golf and there is an edge to be had. Once again, I highly encourage you to be there at 7.30, not 7, 7.30 on Thursday night, not Wednesday night. I have to move it around because it doesn't help us to do it Wednesday night because we won't know the pairings. We got to know the pairings to play the game, right? So be there 7.30 Thursday night to watch the live stream. I will have your ownership. I will have some of your strategies. I'll have everything you need. When have I ever sent you into a golf tournament without preparing your ass? Not in this lifetime, pal. So I hope I have uh, get, gave you a quick intro and this doesn't feel so overwhelming. It's a really fun week. The Ryder Cup is fun when you can have a couple bucks on it and be playing the game. It makes it all the more fun. So now I have a guest. Let's get over to him. Enjoy my interview with Tom Jacobs. All right, I've got my guest here. I brought him back. You, you know it's exciting because at least two times a year, people are like, hey, Jim, did you know that they're playing golf over there in that country of Europe this week? And I heard they're playing America. So this is an exciting time because it's only once uh, or twice, once of the two times all year, America remembers that there's other countries in the world. <laughs> one of the two times, and I brought one of those people from one of those other countries. I had him on for the, op for the Open Championship. He did so good. I've been dying to get him back. The man is Tom Jacobs, and he knows more about the Ryder, Cu Ryder Cup than you and I will ever no tom how you doing my brother yeah good great to be back on um Ryder cup's great i'm actually behind enemy lines as of thursday i'll be in vegas for the Ryder cup so um i might be the only person actually leaving the correct time zone to to go and make it harder for myself um, i assume you're going to be putting some action down i will be yeah um hopefully i'll be kind of sober and not doing it you know degenerately but you know we'll see um when when those pairings come out i'll, I'll get pretty excited now, are you go? Are you a guy that's going to be betting teams, or are you just attacking the individual matchups and the 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 prop bets, like you know, highest rookie and stuff like that? Yeah, like I'll, I'll probably go prop bets and, and matchups. I'm not going to go like I don't want to root against Europe by backing like USA at plus one hundred or whatever. So it's um, yeah, it's a tough one, but I'm just really excited for the event. I think it's shaping up really nicely. All right, so I've already walked people through the basic format because you've probably, I assume, this is like your 58th show to be on this week, I imagine, right? Because us Americans are like, we need a European on this show. And they're like, you're the go-to guy. You're so nice. You're so knowledgeable. You check all the boxes for us Americans. And so um, I, I, I don't know this, but I assume a lot of the shows you've been on have been more betting-based, but I want to focus more on DFS, you know, like yeah. DraftKings, because that's what a lot of people are going to be playing this week. And it's so awesome because, as I said in the intro, this is one of the few times we ever get to play like correlation and like understand that there's literally an advantage uh, at just play, building your lineups a certain way, right? On a normal week, every guy gets to play 72 holes, assuming they make the cut. And like, there's not a, a ton of difference. And if this guy does well, it doesn't necessarily mean this guy does well. But at the Ryder Cup, you can throw all that out the window because so often your success can lead to more success for you and more success for your partner, which we never get to see. So right off the bat, the importance of partners this week, like this is where I got to start because I think this is where it's at. How important do you think that the, those those Friday morning pairings, because we'll get to see those before lock, right? That's the only one we'll get yeah. to see, correct? They're not going to announce the Friday afternoon ones until the morning session's over, right? Correct. Yeah. So you'll get you'll get Friday morning pairings on Thursday night or Thursday afternoon for you guys in the States. Um, and then you'll know who's going out for the foursomes, which is the first session. And that is, that is massive information, right? Because like right there, you already know that the four Americans and the four Europeans not in there literally have zero chance at playing five matches. I mean, that's, that's a mathematical certainty, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You'll know from day one that you're out if, uh, if you bit the wrong guys. 
And the, I think the other thing that's really telling is who they're playing with, right? Like, if yeah. we see any surprising matchups, like, I think a lot of people on the American side are assuming it's going to be Cantlay and Shoffley. Uh, Spieth and Thomas are, are, you know, kind of like the shoe-in pairings, I think, that we're going to see Friday morning. Uh, is there any Europeans uh, that you're, you're pretty confident we're going to see paired up? So we're definitely – so the, the practice groups at the moment have been – uh, Fleetwood, Stracker, Lowry and McRoy in one group, which we're taking to be McRoy and Fleetwood going out first in the foursomes on day one. You've had Rahm, Hovland, Hatton and Aberg, and we're, we're predicting it's going to be Rahm and Hatton and Hovland and Aberg in those two sessions. And then there's been Fitzpatrick, Rose, McIntyre and Hoygaard. Now, McIntyre, I think, is going to sit the whole of Friday. Um, Hoygaard may be reserved for the four balls in the afternoon, which leaves probably Rose and Fitzpatrick as that final foursomes um, in the morning. So as it stands, uh, Tommy Fleet with Rory McIlroy, Ram with Hatton, Hovland with Aberg, and Rose with Fitzpatrick for the foursomes. It's a pretty, it's a pretty solid group. I, I don't think uh, Europe, and maybe this is as big of an underdog as everybody else thinks they are. <laughs> I just think they're no, going to be tough, like, man. A- actually, it's kind of swinging the other way now. Like As we've built up this steam, everyone kind of is all in on, on Europe, right? And I think they're actually going favourites over here. And look, I think that there's... There's one reason for that is that we've seen Europeans for, you know, in recent weeks, like seven of the 12 guys finished inside the top 10 at the flagship DB World Tour event uh, over at Wentworth. And we've only really seen what Justin Thomas and Max Homer since the Tour Championship. So it's kind of out of sight, out of mind for a lot of the Americans, but that could be, you know, deadly by the end. So this is something that, like, we're really going to get down in the weeds here for, like, novice DFS players. But I think that this is one of the three most important things to consider this week. Four balls versus foursomes, right? So yeah. they're going to be going out in foursomes on Friday morning and Saturday morning, right? Yeah. And then they're, and they're doing the four balls in the afternoon. And just to be clear, I want to make sure that I'm not lying to my people. The foursomes in the morning are going to be alternate shots between the two pairs. And the four balls in the afternoon is going to be everybody playing their own ball and you take the best score from the pair, correct? Correct. Yeah, so the idea being that, like, Foursomes, the team chemistry matters a lot. So you need two guys that can play well with each other, can play the one ball because they have to share a ball. Um, That's obviously been a factor over the years. And then four balls, I think you can really get creative. And they they don't always, sometimes they still put the same guys, like they'll still put Xander and and Cantley together, they'll still put Thomas and Speed together or whatever. But four balls, you can get creative. Like there's no real reason why you couldn't put Nikolai Hoygaard and Ludwig Aberg out in four Mm -hmm. balls and just hope that, the one time one of them doesn't make a birdie, the other one does. Like it's and set track will be. Great. I feel like that would be a great team because those two mother fathers make some birdies. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. like to me, the opposite would be like Kepka and Harmon, right? Like I wouldn't want those yeah. two as a as a four ball because they just make pars every hole, right? Yeah. I want guys that make a lot it, of birdies and just assume one of them's gonna make a birdie every hole, right? Yeah, it's really awkward with Harmon because like he on script makes like a really good foursomes partner in the sense of like he should you know, tidy up some people's parts. Like, he should tidy up Scheffler's great approaches, right? Mm-hmm. But on the same, by the same token, no one wants to play from his 250-yard team. <laughs> so it's okay. it's almost better to put him out in four balls, let him go and do his thing and hope he makes a birdie and you right. kind of have the chance to make eagle. So it's... Yeah. It's really weird. That's really interesting because he's so much shorter than everybody. His yeah. his his the second shot in for almost everybody is going to be different than what they are used to. Yeah. Uh, and that yeah that 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 yeah that's that's a really interesting point. I, Brian I, Harmon, I remember, the Hobbit's getting left out. Yeah, I remember speaking to Scotty uh, to Will Zalatoris, sorry, um, on my podcast, and he was talking about his um, experience at the Walker Cup, and I think he was talking about with Cameron Champ, and he was basically saying like he just felt like an absolute ass because he could not play from his ball because he's like I've never hit a seventy yard shot in my life, but you keep leaving me one because you hit it three fifty down the middle, and I can't do that. Um, I can't remember exactly Cameron Chan, but that's the person that came to my mind when he said it. Um, but yeah, like that that is really important. Like no one on that team plays from Brian Harmon's distance. So in foursomes, that's probably why he's not expected to play very often. Um, and in four balls, is he really dynamic enough to really make an impact? So it's it's right. really tough that Harmon, I think, would actually be a really good Ryder Cup player. And I think he might be important on the singles, but I don't know what they're going to do with him. So the, the real question to me is the rookies. Wouldn't rookies be much more likely to be tossed out there in four ball than in foursomes? Because I got to imagine the foursomes is way more nerve wracking knowing that you have a, a, a teammate that has to take whatever shitty shot you hit and they got to go play yeah. it, right? Whereas uh, at least in a four ball, if you make a mistake, you know, like that's just on you. You can go save your own ass. And that, that's got to be a level of pressure, uh, a, a dramatic difference in the pressure, right? Yeah, absolutely right. Like, you know, if you're – if you're a rookie partner, let's say Thomas Peters or Ollison in the past that have been partnered with Rory McIlroy, 
you're so desperate not to let him down, right? Like you don't want to, you don't want him to hit a 350 yard drive down the middle and then you plop your, you know, approach into the bunker or the water or whatever. So, um, yeah, that's absolutely true. You, you tend to kind of, I guess, ease people in with four balls. I think with someone like Aberg, Luther Gayberg, he's going to, just play whatever. Like he's gonna go out in those foursomes early. Why are they just throwing him to the wolf? Are they? Are they like? Are they? Are they trying to like groom him to be their next big star? Yeah, and they want to well, just get him in the frying pan as soon as possible. The idea is that he's gonna be great. And I think, I think to be honest, looking at his trajectory so far, I could see him having a very Victor Hovland esque start to his career, where he, you know, contends in a major next year without really threatening to to win. Um, say contend like finishing top ten, top twelve, and then really ramp it up again in a couple of years' time. Um, but the interesting thing was I was really a big advocate for putting Rory with Aberg because they're the, the two best drivers of the golf ball uh, and maybe they could just overpower people. But then the argument is, do you want to separate them up because you've got two good drivers in two different groups, right? It's a really hard thing to do. So they've now kind of decided he's going to be paired with Hovland. I think a little bit of that's like the language. They both speak the same sort of native language, both Scandinavian. And I just think that ultimately they're both capable of doing everything, four balls, foursomes. It's going to be those Nikolai Hoygaards and Sepp Strackers who are going to be really important in the four balls going into the afternoon. Right. Do you think Hoygaard's a guy we'll only see at four ball, right? We'll see him in the Friday yeah. afternoon and Saturday afternoon, yeah. and then he'll like, get his match Sunday. So he's probably a guy that we can probably safely assume is going to get three matches, right? I would say he gets two. Like, I think, it, I, think I guess, I guess it depends on... That's counting Cowardly. his sun. That's counting his Sunday rounds. So you're saying he's yeah, only going to play but, once between Friday and Saturday, and then get his Sunday round for his second. It really match. depends on how well I guess he does on 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 Friday's four balls. Like if he plays really well Friday four balls, he's going to go back out again on on right. Saturday. In that case, but, he gets those three matches. Yeah, but no chance at four probably, right? No, I don't. No, I can't see it because he'd have to play a four, so which he had he can do. And the same and, with Strucker. Like I think they're both capable of playing three, but not four. What about Bobby Mack? Is where does he fall on that list? Is he also just yeah. a, a two guy? Uh, hidden like yeah don't play him at all um i i would be like they don't do it so it looks like he's probably going to go out at some point in the afternoon in one of the four balls but if anyone's got a chance of playing just one game it could be him because gotcha. he's just he's just out of sorts i mean is that not disrespectful as shit to just have somebody not play at all friday and saturday and then just yeah. throw him out there for the which, which is why europe don't do it like europe yeah. i don't think to be honest i don't think usa really do it either like I don't think when you look back at the history of the Ryder Cup, really anyone plays one. There's always this, oh, they're just going to leave him out until the singles, but they don't really. Um, so he he will go out at some point. I guess the important thing with with McIntyre and someone like that is who do they get paired with, right? Like Fitzpatrick, for example, has a really poor Ryder Cup record so far. Mm. He was played with Lee Westwood at the tail end of his career against a really dominant USA team in Whistling Straits. So do we count those two matches or do we sort of reset now that he's going to have potentially a decent partner? Now, the idea at the moment is that he goes with Justin Rose. How good is that? Like a, a veteran Justin Rose as opposed to at your peak Justin Rose. So it's yeah. it's a really interesting dynamic because sometimes people have a, an unflattering Ryder Cup record and McIntyre might play once and win once um, in the four balls because he gets a great partner like a John Rahm or someone like that um, or even a Tommy Fleetwood. So um, it's a really interesting dynamic and... I think Europe are generally going to stick to the plan of not leaving someone with just one game, but he's the definite potential for it. All right, so here you go. I just made this up in my head because it seems really fun. I'm going to give you over-unders. I know as a betting man, you know yep. what an over-under is. For every European golfer, and you tell me if it's over or under, if you would be betting that, okay? Okay. Aberg, 3.5 matches he plays. This is obviously counting their Sunday round too, right? Uh, over. All right. Fitzpatrick, uh, 3.5. Under. Oh wow! All right, the, see, I I had him at four, so that, I'm surprised yeah. by that one. Fleetwood, three point five, over. All right, Hatton, three point five, over. Hoygaard, two point five. It's a good one, isn't it? Because yeah. it's, like, it's either going to be two. I'm going to have to go under based on, the, on what I'm going to say with the rest. But yeah, under. right. Hovland, four point five. Yeah, every session. Over. All right, uh, Lowry, two point five, under. All right, I'm giving some good ones. Yeah. <laughs> Bobby Mack, 1.5. Yeah, uh, it's going to be over reluctantly. <laughs> but, but it's there is some question, right? Yeah, yeah. Rory, 4.5. Um, under, actually. Wow, all right. I didn't see that one coming. Rom, 4.5. Over, yeah. Rom, 3.5. Do we have Rom? Or Rose, Rose, sorry, Rose. Rose. I'm looking at the wrong name, my bad. Uh, Rose, over 3.5. 
Over, yeah. Wow. So you're going. You're thinking Rose is going to play more than Fitzpatrick. Yeah. Wow. All right. The, See, this is think, this is why I got you on. This is yeah, I got yeah. my my they, preconceived they, notions, and they're wrong. Yeah, I mean, I could be definitely wrong, but like, yeah, I, I think for me with with Rory, so of the top three guys, so Ram, Victor, and Rory, they're they're the guys that are expected to play five, right? I think Rory is the most likely to say, "I need to sit." Like yeah. he's he's done it historically. He did it at Western Straits. We saw how devastated he was at the end of that of how badly he played, and and the thing is. He doesn't seem to be the guy that goes and gets in a groove like Ram and Hatton can get in a groove, um, Aberg and, and Hovland can get in the groove. And then Rory's kind of asked to kind of help everybody. And I don't think he's going to get like, they're not just going to stick him and Fleetwood out for four right. sessions. I mean, it would be great for European chances, I think, if they did, but I think they split him up. So I think he's the one that's potentially disrupted. Rory being soft. Shocking. Shocking. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Victor Hovland and, and John Rum. If you had to bet your all your lunch money, one of them plays five. Who would you be more confident plays five matches? Hovland. Okay. That's how I, I agree with that one, right? And if him and Aberg do well, don't you think you could see Aberg with him at least twice? And then maybe Aberg also gets a four ball out of it too? Yeah. So Aberg is the the cheapest option for the most amount of matches, I guess, is where we're right. probably going. And we're going to know a lot. If they're putting them out there for a force and they clearly think this guy has it. And he yeah. also has a great game for four ball. So he's definitely going to probably get one of those afternoon rounds too. Yeah. Absolutely, gotcha. like he, he can he can play it all. Um, so I guess this is where the theory comes in of of lineup construction, right? Um, yep. And I don't know if you want to segue into that or not, but like always, do you just put Aberg as captain? Well, the thing is, and a lot, I think you know, my first instinct was you always want your captain to play five matches, right? You need yeah. a guy that's going to get you five matches. But the thing is, is if you put Aberg at captain and he gets four matches, and let's say he goes like three zero and one. He could probably get you enough points that because he's so cheap, you can now go put five guys in your flex that can now go play four or five matches, and you're getting tons of matches from your lineup simply because you punted a little bit with your captain spot. So he would be the one cheap option that I think I could probably get on board putting at my captain, knowing that he's probably not going to get five matches. Yeah, because I think I think if you went the other way around and put Hovland as your captain and Aberg as, as the flex, then you're... It's, it's expensive for yeah, no yeah. real reason, right? No real gain. So um, I think I think with Aberg, he has the potential to get five if he plays the way that people expect him to. Yep. I think that he's definitely going to play three, probably four. Um, as you said, he's, he's capable in both formats. Look, we, we can say all this and then they have a real stinker in the first session and get left yep. out. But I just, I do trust him to play a lot. There's so much hype around him. I think he was on the team before anyone really confirmed it um, probably two or three months before even one. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that a uh, Aberg is the one that if you're going to go cheap, that's what you do. And I think that's the way that you get different right? because Hovland's going to be the most popular captain on the slate, I guess. Yeah, probably. And I think Aberg's going to be very chalky too. Yeah. Um, I think I really, I think the only thing I was off on is you seem to be putting Rose a little bit ahead of, ahead of Fitzpatrick, but I think Fitzpatrick's a much different player than he's been in the past. And to me, he's definitively probably the sixth best player on this team. Well, may, maybe even fifth, depending on your rankings. And I, I think that he's a guy that's going to get four matches. And I, I think that he's going to do better than people are expecting. Yeah. So I, I agree with the, he's going to do better than people are expecting. I think people have looked at his record and think, he hasn't got it. And I think if you look back at who he's had to play with and the fit, which is never great, he is a different course fit than he was before, which is good. I think with Rose, the reason I would slightly opt for Rose is I think he's more adaptable in terms of taking out a rookie, whereas you wouldn't want, I don't think you'd want Matt Fitzpatrick taking out Stracker or Hoygaard or whatever. Like I think Rose is a calm influence. It might be Rose that has to take McIntyre out for his one session before the single. So I think that's, I think Rose is just really important for the European team with, with his experience. But I think Rose could play more whilst Fitz could win more. Like I, I think I think Fitz is actually going in under the radar. And like Matt, who I did a show with on, on DraftKings, is very high on, on Fitzpatrick this week. So I mean, look, there's an argument potentially if you think he's gonna play four to put him in as captain, right? But yep. I, the natural pairing isn't there to kind of to stack it up, I guess. All right, let's transition over to the USA, and I'm going to start with a couple hot takes, and you tell me if I'm out of line or if I'm on point here. Okay. I think the first the first hot take I have is that they, you are going to see more guys playing five matches from the European team than you will from the American team. I think there's a chance that nobody plays five matches from the American team just because the American team is a little bit deeper, and I think that almost every American is going to get at least three matches. Okay, so right there. Am I, am, am I way off base? 
No, I agree. I mean, what was it? DJ was the only one to get five matches in 2021, uh, even as well as Xander and Can they play? They did. They only played four, and Morikawa the same. So, no, I agree with that. All right, and, and the other hot take I have is no American will only get two matches. I think almost, and if one of them did, it would be Brooks Kepka because everybody hates him. All right, so there you go. And that that's quite a bit different than what we see from Europe because I think we said with Europe that almost one, probably two, might get only two matches. And I think every American gets at least three. Yeah, there's just such a difference in depth, right? Yep. I think I think the other one that's live to get to is Harmon. Yep. But probably doesn't happen like does he just go out once in four sometimes once in four balls and then the singles again like i th the interesting thing with Harmon is that he would probably make sense to play with someone like a scheffler mm -hmm. um but if burns doesn't play with scheffler why is burns there so scheffler and burns are going to go out first of all but isn't burns just perfect for four ball and probably terrible for foursomes that's exactly that's exactly what I think of of Sam yeah. Burns. The guy yeah. is a bogey birdie, bogey 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 yeah. birdie 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 bogey birdie bogey guy. <laughs> he so, just doesn't make points. So Harmon's like all pars. Yeah. So maybe they do switch up. They they put uh, Scheffler and Burns together in four balls both times, but they give him a different foursomes partner, and that's where everyone gets those two games or three games you're on about. Um, it's just how they do it, I guess. All right, so if you had to pick an American that was going to play five matches, are you just going to cop out and go with the easy answer that it would be Scotty Scheffler, or would you be ballsy and go somewhere else? Uh, I would say it would be Xander. All right, that's, that's, I agree. The other one that I'm really high on, and I just want it to be him, is Max Homer. Yeah. I, I think that Max Homer and Colin Morikawa is a great pairing. Morikawa was great on his debut. Uh, Homer won four out of four points at the President's Cup and is playing really well, so... I guess it's a lazy pairing to put together because they're both California people that have played the QBU shootout once before. Um, but I think it makes a ton of sense. And I actually trust Homer to go head to head with anyone. And I, and I know you wouldn't make him favorite against Ra, Rory, Hovland or whatever, but I think he can give any of them a good game. Plus, he's a dude that's been trending at a course that I actually kind of like him on, yeah. right? Like, this this is a Homa-type style course that I like. Yeah. I'll tell you what. If Homa and Morikawa or Homa and anybody are paired together for the Thursday morning, I think that would be very telling that he is on path to get four matches, and if he is playing well, could sneak into five matches. Yeah, I, I think that that opening session is so telling for for the USA because look, I think Shoffle and Cantlay is the easiest pairing to put together. I think Thomas and... Thomas and Spieth, I think, is what makes or breaks the USA Ryder Cup team. Uh, and what I, what I mean by that is that, like, all the focus has been on JT to step up and prove that he deserves to be on the team, right? It's Spieth I'd be worried about. Like, Thomas yeah. played two or three weeks ago and, and finished inside the top ten. The, the time before that, he played well at the Wyndham Championship, just come up short. Overall, his season's been disappointing, but the, the, the micro, you know, form that we've got from him has been pretty good. And he is just an absolute killer in this in these team formats. Great in Ryder Cup, great in uh, Presidents Cup. So I think it's actually Spieth the question, um, and whether they split those up or not. So that was my next question: Which of those two would have the shorter leash? Because I assume Spieth and Thomas are going to be one of the pairings Thursday morning. Yeah. And let's say they go out there and lose four and three. Which yeah. one do you think is going to definitively not be out there in the afternoon if that happens? Spieth. Yeah, all right. And yeah. why do you say that? Because neither of them are in tremendous form, and I feel like yeah. Thomas didn't really deserve to be on this team. Yeah, so I, I I, didn't think Thomas deserved to be on this team, and then I look back at his record, and it's just so good. And I just think over 18 holes, he's volatile enough to be good enough to, to impress, and I think they trust Thomas on a golf course like this over speed. He needs a little bit more distance. Um, he's shown that, you know, when he came over to the Golf National, he won four points, three and a half points out of five um and he was the only player to to take it to, to go to europe and play the course right um so i think thomas has got that longer leash like at the end of the day like spieth was what like a, i mean he was picked right but he was like an auto pick whereas thomas was like definitively i have to pick you and i have to make this is a bold call to pick you and i think that zach johnson's going to try and be very clear that like that was his pick and and this is why all right, so we've already established that Harmon and Kepka could be at the bottom of the pecking order as far as uh, yeah. a number of matches they play. But I think there's three more, at least in my mind, that I think are in that next bucket right above them. I think that that's uh, Sam Burns, Wyndham Clark, and Ricky Fowler. Yeah. Um, is there anybody else you would put in that group, or would you agree that's like the next group that's going to be that, battling yeah, to get three matches? That's, that's the group. Um, All right, I'm, and of those three, if you had to say one of them could sneak into four matches, would any of them have a chance? Ricky. 
because I think he can work in both formats. Whereas I think Brooks and Burns are better for four. Gotcha. Uh, oh wait, Wyndham, right? Wyndham, Wyndham and Burns. Yes, I had Wyndham in the yeah, yeah. The crabby yeah. group. All right, uh, Cantley. Uh, do you think that him and Xander are only tied together for the uh, Thursday mo- morning and Friday morning uh, foursomes, and uh, not exactly the afternoon sessions? Uh, no, I think they can play both. Yeah. All yeah. right. I, th- I think they can play both. Um, they didn't in 2021, right? I mean, they did split them up, but I think, oh. like naturally, they just they yeah. fit both. And and to be honest, like they're not people that you just go, okay, well, they're great at foursomes. Why would they not be good at four balls? Like they should be good at both. They're the two best players in the team, other than Sheffield. Gotcha. So this has been a good breakdown, but uh, here, I'm going to end it with this. Uh, just a big picture thing. I think this is a really good week to lean more on the Europeans because I think they're going to have uh, uh, more concentrated, more concentration in the number of guys they play. And you want to know something? I think they're going to fucking win. I think they're <laughs> going to win this tournament. I, I, The more I look at these teams, I like the way that the Europeans are going to play to win by putting their best guys out there four or five times. And America's going to try to be like, oh, let's be fair to everybody and not have any hurt. We don't want Brooks going back to live unhappy. Let's get him as three matches, even though he fucking sucks. <laughs> and I think that that is a losing recipe. So I think that I, this is a great week. Oh, and here's one more for you. Tell me if I'm off base with this crazy theory. There is going to be an American ownership bias because, A, they're the favorites, and, B, the majority of people that will be playing DraftKings this week are Americans, and people like to pick the mother fathers that they're rooting for. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely fair. I think the overall, I think it is Europe. The interesting point you say about, like, the USA don't want to send anyone home unhappy, right? Is that that's such a detachment from America in the past, right? They were happy to just let someone be nothing. They'd pair Tiger with Phil, even though it was a terrible decision. Like, they did not care. This time around, they've got these definitive players. They've all picked each other. Speed, Thomas, Kepka, uh, sorry, uh, Xander and, and Cantley, etc. That it is one of those, like, let's look after them. So, yeah, I think there will be a little bit of a, a bias in terms of everyone getting some games. I think they trust everyone to be good. Is there going to be a bias? Interestingly, like, I mean, I'm talking from being in Europe, like everything I've read is just Europe are going to win and they're the best underdog in the entire world. Like, so I wonder if it will flip by the time <laughs> lock comes on Thursday night. Um, I think it all depends on those kind of pairings that gets announced, right? Like, and, and how long after that the, the, the lineup's locked, because if one of those pairings doesn't go how people expect, there could be a big flip flop in, in things. I mean, I think I think we pretty much know the teams, but if suddenly there's a real like if Scheffler goes out with someone that someone really doesn't like, there could be a real flip to Europe, I think. Awesome. Hey, Tom, I appreciate you doing your fifty eighth interview in three <laughs> days. You probably got like another twenty two scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, you are the man. We appreciate you. Will you tell the people real quick where they can find you and what you're all about uh, uh, so my audience can know all about uh, that there's other countries and I've even heard other continents in the world. Yeah, I mean, it's wild how big that globe is out there. Um, so, yeah, Tom Jacobs 93 uh, on the app formerly known as Twitter, now X. Um, I host the Lost for Words podcast. I'm on Mayo Media Network doing the, the DP World Tour show over there and i also on the DP World Tour um betting podcast as well uh infrequently so um plenty of places to find me uh look up for me on there if you have any questions please feel free to send them to me before uh the Ryder cup lock i will be in the air for 15 hours on on thursday but um i will try to get to as many questions as i can all right guys don't forget to be there 7 30 lord's time zone on thursday night be there i will break down all the final thoughts the ownership everything you need to know heading into dfs we'll see you then guys (laughs) 